topic tonight is uh, minimum invasive foot and ankle surgery. You know, I think this is really an exciting topic from my standpoint. It's really kind of a kind of the, a the cutting edge of, of foot and ankle surgery, and it's it's something that. I, I've been starting to pick up over the past few years and I've really seen some great outcomes in my patients. So uh, when uh, Shaley asked me to, what we'd like to talk about, uh, it was the first thing that popped into my uh, my brain. For our agenda this evening, first off, just kind of want to talk about, well, first off, what is foot uh, minimally invasive uh, foot and ankle surgery? Sometimes you'll see it on websites as MIS, uh, foot and ankle surgery. Why are we progressing to that? Uh, what has allowed us to make those changes? And then get, get into what can be treated. You know, really kind of an important topic, I think, as you're trying to, to decide on a, whether you need surgery, but also if uh, minimum invasive foot and ankle surgery is right for you, you know, how to find the right minimum invasive foot and ankle uh, specialist. It is a, a new and upcoming uh, thing. It's one of those things where you want to make sure you find someone that has experience with it and is trained in it. We're really at a paradigm shift in terms of foot and ankle surgery now with uh, minimum invasive uh, surgery. So first off, the goal of any surgery is, is the same. It's first to try to treat any type of pain generator that you have, um, correct the deformity if there is a deformity, and then uh, promote in, in foot and ankle surgery, promote and maintain the biomechanics of the foot. I trained at the University of Washington and Dr. C. Hansen was one of the uh, pioneers and, and truly godfathers of foot and ankle surgery. And with regard to this foot, you know, the, the, the maintaining the biomechanics of the foot, he, he made it simple. He said, you know, just make it look like a foot. And so if you're able to accomplish all of these three things uh, with smaller incisions, uh, that's what we're, what we're going for. Well, how do we get here? Uh, with, with any type of uh, uh, surgery, uh, oftentimes there's a progression. And, and to be honest with you, in foot and ankle surgery, we're a little bit behind the eight ball. Uh, most of uh, other surgical uh, orthopedic surgical specialties, such as shoulders or hands, have been using you know minimally invasive techniques for years and years and years. Well, how did they get there? So first, we start with open techniques, oftentimes with larger incisions. And then over time, people progress to make those incisions smaller, but still doing a, a you know a, a potentially a little bit of a modified open type technique. And then as we over time developed uh, instruments. Uh, such as the arthroscope or smaller cameras to look inside joints, uh, we, we began using arthroscopic techniques. And, and that initially began in large joints, uh, initially the knee and subsequently the shoulder. Uh, and then, as, again, as cameras got smaller, uh, we, we progressed through to the you know, smaller joints, uh, the elbow and eventually into the ankle. And then we got to really small joints, and, such as the, uh, the joints of the wrist or, or the toes. Uh, and finally, we use some of those same techniques and some of those same instruments to not only look inside joints, but also look into body cavities and, and begin looking at percutaneous surgery, essentially. And so when you look at other subspecialties, like I talked about, uh, you, if a doctor talked with you about uh, opening up your knee in, in order to repair your ACL surgery, I'm sure you'd, you'd run, out the, run out the door the other way because you just say, well, are you crazy? There's all these people that are doing arthroscopic ACL reconstructions. Uh, or, or repairing meniscus essentially through little tiny holes. Same thing could be said for, for shoulder surgery, uh, for rotator cup tears or uh, labral tears in order to deal with instability of the shoulders. We've been doing those for, uh, for years and years and years. One of the, the pioneers in, in here in Omaha, uh, Dr. McCarthy uh, has been doing endoscopic carpal tunnel surgery for, uh, it, it's really been uh, years since even before I got here essentially. And so, you know, as we're talking about this within foot and ankle surgery, it, it's almost like we're relate to the game a little bit. But uh, part of that has to do with our anatomy, uh, uh, being dealing with smaller joints, uh, and also part of that has to do with the development of uh, of new uh, new techniques and new instruments, essentially. So, uh, to move on to the next uh, topic point, why minimally invasive foot and ankle surgery? Well, it, it really has to do uh, very similar to why would you do a, a rotator cuff repair through three or four little poke holes in the shoulder. Uh, the, the benefits are, are pretty obvious in that sense. Uh, first off, in terms of uh, an anesthetic with smaller incision, oftentimes it doesn't hurt nearly as much. You can do a majority of the surgery uh, either through uh, with an anesthetic with a block uh, or not as a, uh, uh, not as a <clears throat> deep of, of anesthetic. Uh, in terms of recovery, especially in foot and ankle surgery, we're learning that uh, there's less soft tissue damage. 
there's less pain and oftentimes that leads to a quicker recovery. The same thing is, uh, can be said of uh, the other uh, uh, orthopedic subspecialties. Oftentimes surgery can be quicker uh, when you don't have to close a six or seven centimeter incision, just little tiny poke holes. You can get through that much more quickly. You're not having to dissect as much. And, and so with, as you learn these techniques, oftentimes the surgeries become either A, just as quick or sometimes even quicker. As we're progressing with these new techniques, we're learning that there's uh, smaller risks of infection, decreased risk of nerve damage, just because you, you know where the nerves are, you're not having to expose them and to get them out of the way so much. And then there's also a decreased risk of uh, some vascular injuries. Most important part, obviously, with that is you want to have similar outcomes. Uh, just like we talked about in the beginning, it's really the exact same goal of any type of open procedure, techniques with open techniques. Uh, just These are just a, a few of the topics over the last three or four months. And we're even seeing new books come out uh, over the last few years. Uh, uh, and so this is really has become a, a hot topic. And it really has to do with the fact that you can get uh, very similar results to open techniques, decrease playing quicker recovery. Uh, and so uh, people are trying to kind of uh, jump on the bandwagon at this point. Uh, so what can be treated? Basically, a, a lot of different uh, things can be treated. Uh, one of the big hot topics right now is, is bunion surgery. Um, we're, we're taking big open incisions and making them smaller. Um, you can deal with hammer toes. You can deal with arthritis, both in the ankle as well as in the, uh, the midfoot or subtalar joint. Um, where I train in the University of Utah, we have people come in every single year uh, about the beginning of ski season, say, hey, I tried on my boot again. I, I've got a bump over here. Can you, can you deal with that? Um, so we're doing bumpectomies, uh, and we'll go through that. And then uh, finally, uh, tendon in injuries. Uh, I'm getting close to uh, middle age, and uh, the weekend warrior oftentimes will, will snap their Achilles. And, and so we've been able to uh, do, that, do that surgery through smaller incisions, which we'll go through in just a little bit. So first off, uh, bunion surgery. So what is a bunion? And we've all heard of it essentially. And so uh, basically a bunion is, is defined as uh, an angulation of the toe. So it's a lateral deviation of the toe. Uh, which is uh, over on uh, the, the big toe, it, it kind of crowds the second toe. And that's what people think of. But what happens at the same time is actually a medial deviation of, of what's called the first metatarsal, which is the, the bone in the midfoot uh, that, uh, that basically causes a, a bump over the inside of the foot. People look at it and, and that bump on the inside of the, in the, side of the foot uh, causes pain. So what causes it? We know from previous studies that uh, shoe wear, especially tight shoes, uh, with a tight toe box uh, can, can cause problems and cause angulation of that toe and progress. Uh, and, and overall, over time, that toe basically remains stuck. Uh, and then also in, intrinsic factors such as genetic, flat foot deformity, uh, and ligamentous laxity. We know from uh, populations that don't really wear shoes that there are some individuals with bunions. Uh, but when you compare a population that doesn't wear shoe, which has a bunion rate of about 3%, to a population that does, which has an overall rate of about 36%, we know that uh, shoe wear and tight shoe wear is, is a, a very important part. Uh, and going along with that, we oftentimes see females have a uh, much higher rate of bunions uh, compared to males. They're wearing the tighter, uh, more aesthetically pleasing shoes with a tight toe box. Oftentimes we see women with high heel shoes and, and pointy toe shoes. And, and over time, uh, they develop bunions. And so not only do we see it in females more often than males, but also we see it uh, more often in, in, in uh, a older population essentially. So at the young age, we see it uh, as a two to, one, two to one ratio, but as we get older, uh, women have uh, bunions at a much higher rate of 15 to one. And so again, what is a bunion? So a bunion is that lateral deviation of the great toe. Um, here you can see that medial de deviation of that first metatarsal, which is this bone right over here. Uh, and so that creates the bump over the medial aspect of the toe here, <clears throat> which uh, ultimately creates rubbing against the shoe. Uh, difficulty with finding shoes that you can you can get into uh, and, and wear on a regular basis. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that happens with the bunion essentially is you end up with a rotation of the toe. So not only does the toe angle over, but that rotation of the toe causes the inside of the, the, the plantar medial aspect of the toe often to rub, uh, where it can great, create uh, ta ca uh, a callus as well as pain. Uh, so what is conservative management for this? Uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do for it. Uh, we often talk about wearing wide toe box shoes, um, such as tennis shoes all the time. There are multiple brands of shoes that are kind of more shaped like a foot. Um, Keens and Merrells are good examples. 
Um, but oftentimes individuals don't want to be wearing a tennis shoe to, uh, to a wedding, for example, or uh, to a funeral. Um, and so that's, that's not the perfect solution. Uh, we often talk about toe spacers, which you can see up here on the top right, um, basically to try to create a little bit of space between the first and second toe. Um, some of those also have uh, you know, some basically silicone sleeves that go over to, just to try to decrease the rubbing over the medial aspect of the toe. Uh, and then on the bottom right here, you can see uh, a silicone sleeve, uh, which it basically tries to hold over the toe. So basically all of those things are just try to decrease the amount of wear you have over the medial aspect of the foot. Uh, as well as the amount of uh, space you have between the toes. Uh, I think the important part about all of these, while they can be helpful while you're wearing them, none of them have ever been shown to prevent progression. So if your, your bunion is going to get worse, none of this is going to help. It may help decrease the pain and make it a little bit more tolerable for you. Um, but it's, if, it's, if it's something that does progress and does get worse, uh, none of it has been shown to improve that. Uh, and so when do we do surgery on these people? And Unfortunately, we do surgery when people just can't tolerate it anymore. They've tried conservative management with shoe wear, or tried toe spacers, and the, the toe gets worse, or that bump continues to be problematic. <clears throat> so what are our goals of surgery, essentially? So one is obviously to correct the alignment of the toe. So we want to straighten out the toe, but also we want to remove the bump over the medial aspect of the foot and really narrow the foot so they can fit into, uh, to fit into a shoe. Um, so we used to do this, as you can see on the bottom left, through uh, larger incisions, open techniques. Uh, oftentimes that would entail either one or two incisions that were four to six centimeters in length. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, basically you get lots of swelling, oftentimes some increased pain. Occasionally you get wound healing problems. Uh, but with those uh, more traditional techniques, we have to open up the joint capsule of the big toe. Uh, and basically try to pull the toe over as we shift the bone over essentially. And so with that, oftentimes you can get some tightness uh, in the capsule, you can get some stiffness in the toe, and oftentimes people get pain, especially uh, if that incisions over the medial aspect of the foot. So with our <clears throat> a new bunion, uh, minimally invasive bunion type surgery, we basically have the same goal where we cut the first metatarsal bone, which again is that, uh, that bone leading up to the great toe, we shift it over. But with the, the new burrs that we have, we can basically do that through a poke hole, shift that first metatarsal over, and then hold it in place with two screws, which you can see here on our second photo, as well as our fourth photo, or our photo on the farthest right, essentially. Um, after we do that, we use that same burr to, uh, to basically shave off the big bump on the, on the medial aspect of the great toe, which you can see right over here. Uh, and then oftentimes we'll, we'll straighten out the toe through a second osteotomy, again, through a little poke hole over the medial aspect of the foot and then place a screw in place. So those, <clears throat> those screws allow us very good stable fixation. It allows us to be basically heel weight bearing right after surgery at two weeks once those little incisions are healed up to go to full weight bearing. Uh, and so that recovery process uh, is oftentimes shortened by the span of two to four weeks uh, because we're just making small incisions, we get decreased swelling. Uh, and because we never have to open up that joint capsule, uh, there's no scarring within the joint <clears throat> and overall the, uh, the pain within the toe, but also the stiffness of the toe is, is much less. Uh, with those smaller incisions, we also don't have to keep that toe immobilized quite so long and that decreases that stiffness as well. And so overall, we've seen that we, we get very similar results. You can see how we've narrowed the foot here in the second photo. Uh, we've shifted the, the toe over. We have those sesamoids well reduced. These are these two little bones underneath that metatarsal. And overall, we have that toe well aligned. Uh, and, and oftentimes, at the span of um, weeks after surgery, people are back into a regular shoe as opposed to months. <clears throat> I think my best example was I had a patient that came in at 10 weeks after surgery uh, and came in with was running three miles at a time on the treadmill. So when he was telling me this, I obviously just transitioning over these over the past few years, had a little bit of a heart attack. Uh, I can't imagine ever having one of my, my patients come in at, uh, after surgery, after an open technique uh, with minimal pain and running upwards of three miles. Uh, this is that same patient here on the right. You can see how overall his, his osteotomy is healing nicely. That toe is really well aligned and he's, he's doing great. Uh, and so that recovery process in terms of getting back to work, getting back to activity has been much shortened. It's, um, other things that we can treat uh, are hammer toes. Uh, this is clawing of the toes, essentially. So those toes basically claw up over time. And so that happens with an a, a imbalance between the toes within the foot. We call those intrinsic muscles. And those toes basically 
flex the toes at what's called the MTP joint, essentially, and extend the toes at the IP joints or the interphalangeal joints. So they bend the toes down like so. Well, the muscles in the leg, which oftentimes are much stronger than the muscles in the foot, basically that the exact opposite effect. They, they basically claw the toes or kind of uh, cause uh, uh, flexion at the, the interphalangeal joints, but extension at the uh, metacarpal, sorry, the metatarsal phalangeal joints. And so over time, those extrinsic muscles went out or the muscles in the legs went out and oftentimes those toes end up clawed up. Uh, this can cause uh, pain due to rubbing over the top of the shoe and also pain in the tips of the toes where those tips of the toes rub on the bottom of the shoe there. Uh, again, uh, our conservative management, not ideal. Oftentimes we talk about shoe wear modification. Again, people aren't very excited about uh, wearing uh, open-toed shoes or uh, open-toed shoes here in Nebraska in the winter or very wide toe box shoes or extra depth, extra wide shoes. They're just not very fashionable. And then also we can talk about some strapping the toes, either taping the toes down or things like booting straps, which basically uh, go over the top of the toe to try to hold it straighter. Uh, you can imagine, again, people don't like, don't love uh, wearing those straps all the time. And so <clears throat> uh, hammer toe surgery uh, with the traditional technique, it basically involves a oftentimes three or four centimeter incision over the metatarsal bone, which again, are these bones leading up to the toe here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, which, uh, and go ahead and cutting out the, what's called the proximal phalanx or the proximal PIP joint uh, in order to be able to straighten those toes and, and get them into a straight position. Oftentimes we have to add this a wild metatarsal osteotomy in order to, to shorten the, the metatarsals as well in order to be able to get those toes in order to straighten out uh, with not causing contractures to the blood vessels on the bottom of the foot. Uh, and then in order to hold those toes straight, we oftentimes have to put pins in place and oftentimes those pins would remain in place for four weeks. Well, those pins can break. And so oftentimes, so after surgery, those, those individuals will be non-weight bearing for two weeks and then heel weight bearing after that. Uh, we pull out those pins at four weeks, at, at the four week mark, which uh, ultimately with those toes being straight at, at four weeks, oftentimes uh, those, those toes end up being uh, straighter, which is great. They don't rub on the top of the shoe, uh, but they're very stiff. And so when I talked with patients about these, uh, we're doing it through a more traditional open technique. We'd often talk about uh, people ending up with stiff straight toes. So I, I reiterate to them multiple times in, in the preoperative area, as well as, as leading up to surgery that the toes, while they're gonna look uh, more straight, they're not gonna feel straight. They're not, they're not gonna feel normal. They're not, they're not gonna be flexible. Uh, as we move towards more minimally invasive surgery, we can often accomplish those same goals through little poke holes and incisions, essentially. So you can see here as on the top right, uh, this, this claw toe to form your hammer toe. Uh, and basically what we do is we make a small little stab incision in order to lengthen the, the tendons over the top of the toe that are pulling that metatarsal phalangeal joint up uh, right in here. Uh, and then we also make a small incision over the bottom of the foot in order to allow those those, flexion, those uh, flexors of the toes, which are holding the IP joints flexed uh, in order to be able to straighten the toe. Now, oftentimes there's contractures at the joint with the soft tissue. And so we need to go in and also cut the bones in order to be able to straighten those out. And again, we can do that with a little tiny burr uh, and a little stab incision. Uh, after the surgery, <clears throat> you can see here, we, we hold those straight toes straight with a bandage essentially, as opposed to a splint. So with this bandage, we get the bandage wet. It basically, when it dries, it almost becomes a splint and holds those toes straight. Uh, those toes, uh, <clears throat> those bones heal up just like they would if you, you break your toe. Uh, and then we're able to get you out of your post-op dressing, get you walking on it basically from the time of surgery uh, because there's no pin in the toes uh, essentially. And, and so you end up with a quicker recovery, less stiffness of the toes. Uh, and, getting, and getting back into a normal shoe much stiffer because we're doing it through a little tall, small stab incision as opposed to a big four centimeter incision over the metatarsals and then uh, uh, multiple, or, or, sorry, incisions over the proximal phalanx as well. Um, other things that we can correct, um, any type of bump over the foot. So uh, oftentimes people will come in with Taylor's bunions. We see this oftentimes in, in, in Utah when I was there, this, this uh, protuberance uh, out the, the lateral side of the foot um, and basically causes uh, rubbing against the shoe wearing pain. Uh, we see that a lot in skiers. <clears throat> Oftentimes people, people with great toe arthritis or what we call hallux ridges, we can see here on the bottom right, uh, creates a bump over the top of the foot. No, sorry, the top of the, the toe essentially, and that can rub on the top of the foot 
uh, and cause, uh, cause pain essentially. Uh, so again, the conservative management of these type of these bumps is basically shoe wear modification. Those deep toe box shoes or those wide toe box shoes sometimes will add a little silicone pad over there to try to prevent the rubbing uh, and decrease the pain and then little horn pads. Um, as you can imagine, people aren't too excited about that. And so uh, with these new minimally invasive surgeries, these burrs, we can basically make a little small incision uh, of about a half a centimeter length and use the burr to kind of to take off the bump, which you can see I've here done, done here on the right. Um, this is just two weeks after surgery. You can see the patient just has a little bit of swelling, but also uh, the incision sealed up. They're getting back into a, uh, a regular post-operative shoe, which I, I wouldn't let them do for probably until about six weeks out of the more, uh, more open traditional uh, technique. Uh, and they're, they're getting back on their way. Uh, oftentimes, these patients need just a few doses of Tylenol after surgery just because that little tiny stab incision uh, heals up within no time. Um, we can also deal with arthritis. And so uh, the ironic thing is this is actually one of the bigger procedures that we do through a minimally invasive technique, but because it was within the joint, uh, we've been doing it for a longer, ten, uh, longer period of time. So first off, what is arthritis? We oftentimes uh, know about hip and knee arthritis. We've had hip and knee replacements for years and years and years. Uh, hip and knee arthritis is often related to wear and tear over time. I uh, just walk around for years, the cartilage wears down in the joint and eventually the two bones rub against each other causing pain. <clears throat> and in the foot and ankle, it's oftentimes, it's a, it's a similar end result, but oftentimes it's, it's post-traumatic uh, as opposed to just wear and tear. So oftentimes people have uh, ankle sprains or they break their ankle and then uh, some years later, sometimes just within a few months, but some years later, they develop arthritis of the pain. Uh, again, conservative management, people don't love. We're talking about bracing. You can see here an ASO brace on the top right, uh, which is fairly flexible, but gives the ankle a little bit of support. <clears throat> and then we have uh, what are called Arizona braces, uh, which is one made out of leather here on the top left. Uh, and then one made out of uh, a newer technique of carbon fiber here, which actually uh, designed in Omaha. So it's called an Omaha Arizona brace, uh, which, which basically hold the ankle uh, in place, essentially, and don't allow those, those bones to rub over each other, causing the pain. Um, we can also use cortisone injections or anti-inflammatories over time. Um, people often consider those a, a band-aid, but we're trying to decrease pain with those. Um, once patients, <clears throat> uh, once patients uh, fail those uh, conservative managers, often talk, so we talk about surgery. Um, we do have an uh, ankle joint replacement, um, but we also can, uh, most of the time in ankle arthritis, the gold standard remains a fusion type procedure. And with that, we basically make the two bones uh, we trick the body into thinking that there's a fracture between the two bones and then basically make those two bones grow together. Um, and that, again, has been uh, a very tried and true method. It's, it works very well. It's excellent with pain relief. And because you don't have such a long moment arm like the knee, uh, that decreased motion people often uh, tolerate very well. Um, so the more traditional technique, uh, this is a patient that I did uh, using a plate and screw. Uh, we have to make a long incision over the front of the ankle and go past the extensor tendons over the, uh, the front of the, the foot and the ankle, essentially, in order to get down to the bone, essentially. Uh, we open up the joint, we scrape all the cartilage out, and then we have to put these plates and screws uh, in place. Uh, and so uh, it, it's basically done through, oftentimes this is about a 10 centimeter incision. People have a significant amount of swelling afterwards um, because they have that plate over the front of the ankle or, or sometimes through a more traditional lateral technique, uh, a plate over the side of the ankle, they often can times have uh, pain with the hardware uh, from those tendons running over the top uh, and, and complications over the, uh, from uh, the recovery process. Uh, anytime we go through the front of the ankle, it can also be an area that it doesn't have the greatest blood supply, so you can have wound healing problems, which always makes us nervous. Uh, we, uh, we've been able to do this technique uh, using a scope uh, uh, for now about 10 or 15 years or so. Uh, and this entails just making two small incisions over the anterior medial and anterior lateral aspect of the ankle, sticking a, uh, a camera in the ankle joint, uh, and then basically scraping away the cartilage in the same way we would have with an open technique. But because we're able to do that through two little small poke holes, the amount of soft tissue dissection, the amount of pain with that is much less. Uh, and then instead of using plates and screws, we oftentimes just use these large cannulated screws. Uh, in order to hold the, plane, the, the bones in place after we've got them created a good bleeding bone surface in order again to trick the body into thinking that there's a fracture. And you can see here how this patient basically had those two bones grow together. So again, uh, with this, we see because we see less dissection, we see less pain after surgery. Oftentimes, 
less swelling. That fusion oftentimes happens more quickly because we don't have to have as uh, much dissection. We don't decrease the blood supply to amount to the joint. Uh, and overall things just heal, heal better. Uh, oftentimes when we go and create that good bleeding surface, because that joint capsule remains in place, <clears throat> all that good, uh, that good uh, basically hematoma, which has the, the uh, bone marrow progenitor cells, uh, and there are the, basically the stem cells which will grow in the bone, remain in there, and, and quicken that healing process. Uh, and so when we, we've looked in the, in the literature, oftentimes uh, the recovery process for this is, is weeks uh, quicker than an open type procedure. Uh, more recently, over the past five years or so, we've also been able to do uh, tendon type surgery. Um, Achilles, tendon, Achilles tendon tear are especially prominent in, in patients that are my age. We often talk about the weekend warrior that's playing basketball uh, or, or soccer, uh, you know, trying to get back to their, their glory years of, of college or high school. Um, uh, and they oftentimes will feel a pop in the back of the ankle. Uh, oftentimes patients will, will, will come in and say, oh, I thought my buddy kicked me in the back of the ankle. It just has that sensation, essentially. Afterwards, they have pain, uh, swelling in the back of the ankle. They have weakness of the plantar flexion and, and difficulty getting around. Um, there's a, a, a specific test that we do for this. It's called a Thompson test, where we basically squeeze the calf muscle and we find that the, the ankle doesn't move. Uh, when that uh, is positive, we know that there's a complete tendon rupture. Uh, we were able to confirm that with either an MRI or ultrasound, which I've uh, the ultrasound is what I've kind of uh, moved to more recently. It's uh, it's cheaper, it's quicker. We can tell the patient within the within the clinic uh, and have a definitive diagnosis there. Uh, <clears throat> over the past few years, we we have uh, there's two types of management. This first off is conservative management, where we're placing a splint and then uh, do a functional rehabilitation program uh, uh, with getting them into a boot, getting them into some formal physical therapy, really a, uh, an extensive physical therapy program. Uh, this has been overall been shown to be uh, a very good. Uh, when you look in the literature, it's been shown to have similar strength uh, and similar recovery process. Um, but as we know, uh, all our, our top level athletes, if they were going to end up with having uh, uh, those individuals that need to have power, those individuals that need to have explosiveness, uh, that's not an ideal uh, situation for them. There's a reason Kobe Bryant and Kevin Durant uh, didn't go with conservative management. Oftentimes, we're able to slow, uh, get the ankle moving a little bit more quickly uh, with, a sur uh, with a surgery. Uh, <clears throat> more recently, we've been able to do that surgery through uh, smaller, uh, smaller incisions. So again, the more traditional technique oftentimes is in involves a four to five centimeter incision over the posterior, either the posterior aspect of the ankle or the posterior medial aspect of the ankle. Uh, we basically pass sutures through both ends of the tendon uh, and then bring them together and, and tie them together. Uh, that allows those tendons to be reapproximated essentially, so they're not going to gap, uh, and we can get that ankle moving more quickly. Uh, well, over the past five years or so, uh, we've moved towards a more transverse incision, or sometimes people even do it through a shorter longitudinal incision, and then we have this what's called this pars jig, or a percutaneous uh, jig essentially that we pass in. It goes around the ankle joint, and then we're able to pass those sutures through little tiny poke holes through the skin. So we're able to bring those tendons together uh, again, the same that we would. We oftentimes use locking stitches, which give us good tendon bite. Uh, and, and, and the data has been able to show similar recovery, similar power to compare to open surgeries, but oftentimes a quicker return to work. Uh, so in our work comp patients or our athletes that are trying to get back uh, in the off season or uh, get back uh, a little bit more quickly, uh, it's, been, it's been shown to be just as effective uh, with decreased wound complications compared to a longer open incision. <clears throat> so uh, as we've been moving to this, uh, this is, these are all techniques that you just don't learn overnight. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot that's different about it. You, you don't have, you're not directly either looking at the bone or tendon essentially. So it, it really involves an understanding of the anatomy uh, that you're going through. Um, with, for example, the Achilles tendon, you need to know where that sural nerve runs. You don't want to make, you want to make sure that you get that sural nerve caught in the knot, essentially. And so <clears throat> as you're, you're looking for quite a, a doctor that's moving towards this, you really want to make sure that they're experienced, that they've gone through a, a, a process of learning. Uh, oftentimes these, these surgeries involve specific instruments that are different from those instruments that we're using with open surgeries that we'll talk about in just a second here. 
um, up, uh, with these new minimally invasive surgeries, oftentimes the room setup is a little bit different. Um, you need to know how to bring in the, the x-ray machine to help, it, help you guide your, to help guide your cuts. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not going to get in the way. You need to make sure that you're, you have the, <clears throat> the cord set up and they're, they're not going to be uh, going up into the, the non-sterile part of the field, essentially. And then uh, with the recovery process, a lot of times with these bony cuts, uh, you're needing to help support the toes or help decrease the swelling. And so post-op bandaging can be important. So <clears throat> the, the special instruments that we're oftentimes using with these uh, new bunion type procedure, new hammer toe procedure are burrs. So they're specifically designed. Um, they're high torque, uh, low speed burrs <clears throat> that are uh, don't create a whole lot of bone. Uh, sorry, a whole, a whole lot of heat at the the bone cut. Uh, so you're not killing the the, the bone cells which need to heal. Um, <clears throat> and then you also need to make sure that you understand where you need to insert insert that burr essentially. You don't want to be able to go, you want to be going through nerves. You can't see those nerves essentially. Uh, and so you need to have a, a good understanding of anatomy. Uh, you can see here, there's multiple nerves over the top of the foot. There's multiple nerves over the medial aspect of the foot. You really need to understand what those nerves, not only those nerves are on, but also those tendons and blood vessels in order to be able to avoid them. So having a good understanding or really a, an excellent understanding of anatomy is really important. Uh, so these are some examples of those specialized burrs that we use. Uh, you can see how they're all very long and narrow, essentially. Um, <clears throat> they, they basically uh, create minimal, uh, we're able to get them through a, a half a millimeter incision. Uh, they, they create minimal soft tissue disruption. You can actually try to run these burrs on a tendon. Uh, and unless you're pulling on it, they basically don't cause any tendon damage. Um, if the, the nerves are a little bit more tenuous, essentially. So they could potentially uh, wrap those up. So you need to be cognizant of those, but overall, <clears throat> because they don't create heat, they create less soft tissue damage, they minimize that swelling. Um, moreover, these burrs allow us to help keep that fracture, what we call a hematoma or that, that blood, uh, kind of the bleeding that we're, we're relying on in order to get the, uh, to get the, uh, the bone to heal within the, what's called the periosteum of the bone. So it remains in place, keeps all those good cells that we want to keep with those bone forming cells that we want to keep within that fracture hematoma remain in place. Uh, and it's really this bone slurry that will create, that allows this, the, these bones to heal much more quickly, essentially uh, uh, in, in order to get, uh, to get you moving uh, sooner, as, uh, sooner compared to an open type procedure. <clears throat> more recently, and this is uh, the development of these specialized screws uh, that allow compression, uh, but also be, uh, that are cannulated to be put over uh, a wires, uh, allow rigid fixation of the bones in order to hold them in place, allow for that early weight bearing, uh, and allow for not only the, the weight bearing of the foot, but also the toe range of motion in order to get the, uh, the joints mobilized in order to decrease that stiffness. Uh, and so it, it's really having the right instruments, making sure you have the correct burrs, make sure you understand how to use the burrs, make sure you understand the technique, uh, needed to uh, to cut with the burr, which is different from a saw, uh, becomes critically important. Uh, we've we've seen studies that were done five and ten years ago before we've had all these special techniques and understood these techniques within the United States that demonstrated very poor results, which is why uh, potentially probably why that we've been a little bit late to the game in terms of getting to minimally invasive surgery to, to, compared to uh, our counterparts in uh, the shoulder, the hand, for example, or even within Europe. Uh, again, so those uh, techniques that we've talked about, uh, the, bone, the bone cuts, uh, you need to understand uh, whether to do them more of a transverse bone cut or uh, which uh, allows for rotation with that bunion type repair that we've talked about. Uh, but also you need to understand the, the, and the skill that's needed in order to not only shift the bone, but shift it, not uh, translate it superiorly or inferiorly uh, to create a, a bony prominence. Uh, and then also, be able to align that rotation and pin into place at the same time. So this isn't something that you learn overnight. This is something that you learn with repetition. And oftentimes it's something that you should be learning on a, on a cadaver or, or, or a saw bones in order to, to perfect it. Uh, and then you translate it into, uh, into patient care. Uh, and so this is something that as you're looking for a surgeon, you wanna make sure that they've been able to go to courses. They understand the techniques, uh, they understand, sorry, they understand the new techniques uh, and they they've had a practice with it. Uh, and then getting to post-operative dressing, 
Oftentimes our dressings are not only decreasing the amount of swelling that the patients are having, but in, in case of a hammer toe, they're literally holding the toes in the proper alignment. And so you wanna have someone that's not only just, not just putting on their, their typical post-operative dressing, you wanna have someone that's gone to a training course and understands how to do this, how to, how to place it in a position to hold the toe, to decrease the amount of uh, muscle forces that are gonna be pulling on and really to counter those muscle forces uh, in, in order to help uh, stabilize the toe, help, help stabilize the swelling, which will help get you up and back on your foot more quickly uh, and, and decrease your pain. And so as I've talked about finding the MIS doctor, this is, uh, I just got back from uh, Florida uh, where we're practicing uh, and really advancing some of the techniques uh, uh, here. Uh, you can see here, Rich is one of the, the reps that was kind of helping take me through it uh, and the process. And so when you, when you talk with your doctor, what do you want to ask them? Well, first off, ha have they done a literature review? Have they, uh, have they read about the techniques? Have they really, uh, as opposed to just, you know, watch a video, do they understand the progression of the techniques? Do they understand, well, why are we using these screws as opposed to a K-wire, for example? Do they have those screws that you need? Do they have the burrs? Have they practiced with it? <clears throat> um, over the past year with COVID, um, there's been additional virtual training courses where you can go and really uh, get get uh, hands-on experience, much like this webinar here. Uh, sorry, not hands-on experience, but uh, technique tips from the from the experts, essentially. There's actually a foot and ankle minimally invasive course that was done in 2020, which I participated in, which helped me get a better understanding of the techniques, helped me kind of hone my techniques uh, and by uh, getting to the, the experts, essentially. Uh, and then, like I just talked about, I, I've gone to multiple cadaver courses in order to <clears throat> have met with and, and gotten hands-on experience with experts in the field, uh, have gotten hands-on uh, training with the birds in order to understand how to use them, how to rotate your hand, which is different from rotating your hand with the saw, uh, have been able to practice, been able to use the jigs, uh, and then been able to use the screws in order to really uh, perfect these techniques uh, and improve with these techniques uh, over time and, and not, not having your, your position practice on you, uh, making sure they have a, a good understanding of it. So again, <clears throat> kind of going through and, and what are our takeaways essentially? So what are the advantages of uh, minimally invasive surgery? So first off, we're seeing in the literature that you can get very similar outcomes oftentimes with decreased pain and swelling, shorter recovery times, decreased stiffness, uh, and earlier transition to shoes. Uh, but again, I reiterate that it's, it's really that, that excellent outcome that you're looking for. So we're, we're learning from more and more studies that are coming out really weekly and monthly, essentially right now that uh, with these newer techniques where they're at least equivalent, if not even sometimes better than our previous more traditional open techniques, essentially. Uh, but I think from a patient standpoint, you're looking for that great outcome, but you're gonna really benefit from that decreased pain, just taking Tylenol, getting back to work quicker, getting back in your regular shoe quicker. Uh, and, and it's gonna be those things that, you, that I think patients and, and my patients have really been I um, really benefited from and, and really, uh, really liked essentially. Uh, what are the dis or potential disadvantages of, it, of it essentially? And so I think one of the big things is just like any other new surgical technique, uh, it requires, it, it really, it, there really is a learning curve with it. And so you want to find that doctor that has experience with it. You want to make sure that they've gone to the, the cadaver courses, they practice. Uh, you want to make sure that they can show you, well, what have their other patients done? What are can you show me your my the x-rays of uh, other patients that have had uh, had this surgery done after uh, beforehand? What did the clinical pictures look like essentially? Uh, and then you want to make sure that they have access to those new uh, <clears throat> new surgical techniques, the new instruments, and, and they've had a chance to practice on it. And so it's it's really that learning curve uh, and then transition over that you want to make sure that you've had uh, that your your physician that you're finding. Uh, and, and working with it has gone through essentially and that they have a, a good understanding of that essentially. And so, like I said, I, I think the, the main advantages are, are gonna be patient decreased pain, decreased swelling, uh, but you, you don't want to <clears throat> jeopardize your clinical outcome uh, uh, because you, you're, having, you're, you're dealing with a new physician or a physician that's just transitioned to these, to these new techniques. Uh, and, and as a result, your bunion comes back or uh, your Achilles tendon stretches out or your hammer toe occurs essentially that you're not gonna be happy in the end. Uh, so really finding the right surgeon can be key with this. So now 
uh, as we've kind of gone through that. I think those are just a, a few of the samples of kind of some of our newer techniques. I, I think you can kind of see uh, the plethora of, of, of new techniques, not, not only new techniques that we have, but uh, the, the potential benefits of it will open the, open things up to uh, our Q&A session. The question is, uh, where you do MIS surgery and at which, which locations? Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're located first off throughout the, the Methodist system. We go from uh, Health West, which is located out west. Uh, we even have some physicians that go out to Fremont uh, Methodist Main Hospital. And then we also go over to Jenny Edmondson Hospital and Council Bluffs. Uh, we have a little uh, orthopedic hospital called Midwest Surgical Hospital, uh, also uh, right by Methodist Hospital. Uh, we have all of these techniques uh, uh, and all of these uh, surgeries can be done at any of those hospitals, essentially. So we have basically throughout the Omaha uh, area, we, we we're able to do these techniques. You're not going to have to go to you know drive 25 minutes to, uh, to get to West Omaha in order to get these techniques. Uh, they're really located throughout uh, the whole area essentially, and we're able to provide same care uh, throughout the whole Methodist system. <clears throat> uh, can I have both my feet operated on at the same time? <clears throat> uh, most of the time, the answer to that is is no. Um, if you're having a, a, for example, a simple, a more simple or smaller type procedure like a hammer toe or a single hammer toe that needs to be done on both sides, uh, that may be an exception. Um, there is a, if you're just doing a smaller surgery in order to correct the deviation of the gray toe, um, that is something that on occasion you, you can do at the same time because you'll be fully weight bearing from the get go. Um, but even with these minimally invasive techniques, um, I oftentimes tell people you at least need to have a good foot to stand on essentially. And so um, while that recovery process will be shorter, if you do have, a, for example, a bunion on both sides, we're able to get to them quicker, uh, oftentimes within the span of months, as opposed to, you know, half a year or nine months that you sometimes need to relate, need to wait between them. Um, I guess like you could say, I haven't gotten courageous enough in order to do them at the same, at the same time. Uh, and, and most of the time, I think people find that even though the pain is less, uh, having a good foot to stand on can be can be key. Um, so I guess the answer to that is, is sometimes you can with little smaller procedures, bunionettes, hammer toes, maybe a potentially an achan osteotomy or a very mild bunion on both sides. Uh, but some of those bigger type procedures <clears throat> that require multiple bone cuts, uh, most of the time the answer to that is no. Um, are all can all uh, bunions and hammer toes uh, be corrected using MIS? Uh, I'd say the majority of, of, of bunions and hammer toes can be corrected uh, with, with MIS, not all though. Um, there are some surgeries that, uh, for example, if you have what's called a hypermobile first ray uh, or a very severe bunion surgery, uh, those are, are types, those are, are, are still, uh, those are still surgeries that are, are best done with a more open uh, type procedure, such as a lapidus type procedure. Um, now, we have been advancing and doing some of those procedures uh, minimally invasive, but if you do have a skip amount of instability at that first uh, tarsal metatarsal joint, or if you have a very severe bunion, uh, there's, there's some still where you're going to need more open uh, types of releases and more open types of bony cuts. Uh, but I'd say probably 70 to 80 percent of, of a typical bunion, uh, and I'd say pretty much vast majority of hammer toes can be corrected using these MIS techniques. Um, but like everything else, there are limits to what you can do uh, uh, with these uh, specialized techniques. Uh, <clears throat> uh, would you ever need to be an inpatient for these procedures? Uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques uh, sometimes can be part of a larger procedure. Um, one of the things I actually didn't go through today um, you can actually correct some, uh, use minim these minimally invasive techniques as part of a, a bigger procedure. Uh, for example, a large <clears throat> flat foot correction. Uh, some of that procedure you need to do as an open type procedure, um, but you can do parts of it in order to decrease the swelling, decrease the pain, such as the calcaneal osteotomy, where you shift the heel bone either to the inside or to the outside through just one little small nick. Um, if you were doing, you know, having a minimally invasive procedure that was done uh, as part of that, uh, that could be a case. Uh, and then uh, sometimes people need to have an inpatient procedure done, not necessarily because of the procedure itself, um, but because you do still need to do with some of these procedures need to be, minimize your weight bearing, at least for a period of time. 
Um, and, and some people can have difficulty, maybe they have a shoulder or a rotator cuff injury, for example, uh, difficulty being non-weight bearing uh, for that period of time. And so sometimes those would need to be done as an inpatient type procedure. But I'd say the vast majority of these procedures, again, can be done as an outpatient procedure where you can go home the same day. Um, oftentimes we can combine those with blocks in order to help minimize that pain medicine you puts numb uh, for the remainder of the day. Uh, and, and so you can really expedite that recovery process and get back to work quicker. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> what do I need to do and not do in the days or weeks before my surgery? Uh, really oftentimes, uh, uh, to answer that, it would be something that would be limited more so by your pain. Um, it's, it's one of those things where oftentimes these procedures I've talked about, hammer toes, bunions, um, you could do all of your activities that you're able to tolerate before your surgery, essentially. Um, uh, and they're not, you're not going to be limited by coming up to the surgery. Uh, now, if you do have, uh, for example, some lower extremity edema, which is swelling in the lower extremity or swelling extending into the foot. Uh, we may ask you to keep your foot elevated for a few days before surgery. Um, like all surgeries, oftentimes you'll need to go to see your primary care doctor to get a history and physical, um, uh, and then you know, come in and see us in, in order to understand the risk and benefits and make sure that the surgery is right for you. But I think in terms of activity, there's not a whole lot you need to do in terms of eliminating before surgery. Uh, um, after surgery, uh, will I need a brace a crutch or a walker. Uh, oftentimes going home, uh, these surgeries do still hurt. Uh, a lot of times we'll let people be heel weight bearing, but it can be um, somewhat uh, difficult to be non-weight bearing or heel weight bearing. It can, uh, uh, you just have your, your balance is just off. Um, sometimes we'll combine these with blocks in order to decrease the amount of pain. Uh, a block basically is numbing up the foot. And so in those situations, We'll oftentimes send people home with the crutches or a walker. Um, if people have to go longer distances or if they have a ranch home, oftentimes it's easier to get, get around uh, using a, uh, an e-scooter, for example. Uh, and, and oftentimes just having the foot down, you still do get some swelling with this and having your foot up and elevated uh, helps your pain control. So uh, most of the time I'll talk with people about using a crutch or a walker, at least for the first uh, few days or even the first couple of weeks after surgery. Um, after a bunion surgery, we'll often use a, a toe spacer, or even use a, a little type of bunion splint just to order to hope, in order to help maintain your correction. Uh, and then after uh, some of the bigger surgeries that we talked about, like uh, an ankle arthrodesis, for example, or that ankle fusion, uh, uh, oftentimes you'll, need, you'll still need to be non-weight bearing for a period of time. And again, that ankle fusion type procedure, those bigger type procedures, uh, you know, that's something that you may have to stay overnight for. Uh, if you're not, to, you're not able to be weight bearing, oftentimes even those bigger type procedures, we're able to get patients home the same day. Uh, what is, well, is PT like? Will I need physical therapy? Uh, that's a great question. And oftentimes uh, with these, we're combining it with early range of motion and early physical therapy. Uh, I think one of the, the neat things about uh, physical therapists is, uh, that people don't realize is that physical therapists can do a lot to get you feeling better and get your toes, your ankle and your toes moving much more quickly. Uh, so in some of these bigger type procedures like the ankle fusion, oftentimes use those physical therapists, not only to get the swelling down, oftentimes to desensitize the foot, start doing some early range of motion once we're able to get the, the foot into a boot. Uh, once the scars are healed, I'll oftentimes do work on scar massage in order to decrease the amount of pain around the massage. Uh, and then they can do things like lymphatic massage in order to basically help get some of that swelling out of the foot. Um, uh, so oftentimes uh, PT will help us in terms of getting you back mobile, uh, helping with the progressive weight bearing process, but also just getting you feel, getting you feeling better uh, and getting that early range of motion, which with, with a lot of these procedures we're looking for uh, and really try to uh, really trying to. Uh, uh, part of the reason that we're doing this procedure. Uh, and so physical therapy can be an integral part to this. Uh, and, and oftentimes we'll get you going into physical therapy sometimes as early as two weeks after surgery to get that toe moving. Uh, or sometimes after the bigger procedures, we'll sometimes wait four to, uh, four to six weeks uh, and really get you, once those incisions are healed up uh, and you're progressing with that weight bearing, uh, incorporate the physical therapist so they can be an important part to this. Uh, 
<clears throat> one of the questions is that what are the distinctions be, uh, between podiatrists and orthopedists? Uh, can a podiatrist do these type of surgeries, including uh, the MIS procedure? Uh, there are a number of podiatrists that are doing these type of MIS procedures. And again, uh, if they've gone through uh, the training processes, uh, much of that training that we were talking about, uh, I, I think they can do a, a, a good job. <clears throat> uh, but I, I think being orthopedist and, and going through the training process that we go through uh, can, can provide distinct advantages. Uh, as I've talked about, uh, a lot of the procedures that we've talked about uh, you know, involve scopes or, or, or <clears throat> involve uh, things that uh, we going through an orthopedic training, a, a five-year training program, scoping shoulders, scoping knees, uh, <clears throat> using uh, some of these percutaneous uh, procedures on, uh, for example, femur fractures really can, uh, can help set us apart in, in terms of not only decreasing that learning curve, which also oftentimes we're going through, uh, but also just uh, understanding how you use that, uh, use the scope. Uh, for example, <clears throat> just because we've had, we've used these type of procedures uh, throughout the body and throughout our training process, essentially. And so uh, I think our, our training being you know, a little bit longer, uh, quite frankly, uh, and also uh, going throughout the, the remainder of the body, for example, understanding how the foot interacts with the knee and interacts with the hip during the gait cycle. Uh, can be very important and kind of can set us apart uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, understanding the biomechanics uh, and, and really uh, having a good understanding of the surgical techniques. Uh, so again, uh, if you have a podiatrist that's gone through the training process, they can do these uh, MIS uh, techniques. But uh, I think our training, uh, understanding the, uh, the, the anatomy uh, and really using these, having used these techniques throughout our training process and throughout the other joints that oftentimes many of us foot and ankle orthopedists uh, treat can be a, a distinct advantage. <clears throat> uh, what happens if you need surgery, uh, uh, do you have, uh, but you have to wait? Does it make it worse or how long can you wait? <clears throat> uh, that's a great question essentially. And so uh, with some of these uh, type, of, type of procedures, uh, for example, uh, ankle arthritis, for example, uh, if you're able to tolerate the pain, you're able to wait, uh, you, can, you can potentially wait indefinitely as long as there's not significant deformity. Uh, I think as we're, we're discovering with, with bunion type procedures and with hammer toe type procedures, uh, those are something that uh, a little bit are a little bit easier to correct uh, when they're not quite as severe. Uh, but also you don't want to wait so long that you can end up with, <clears throat> so for example, syncesum arthritis. When we're talking about abundant, there's two bones that sit underneath uh, the metatarsal bone that we're trying to correct. Uh, and when you have a, a, a bunion type, a, a bunion, basically those aren't articulating with the cartilage that they're supposed to. Uh, and so you could end up with arthritis so that those, those sesamoids essentially, even when you put the bone back where it's supposed to go, because you have arthritis of those sesamoids or because you developed arthritis of the big toe, uh, you, you won't have as good of outcome essentially. And so <clears throat> what I usually tell people is I think it's worthwhile to at least have a discussion uh, with, a, with a foot and ankle provider uh, if you're having some of these symptoms just to get a better understanding and they can uh, kind of, they can deal with that in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Uh, for example, with a hammer toe, if, if you're dealing with a hammer toe and you're having problems, but that hammer toe is flexible, uh, you can do a much less invasive pr procedure where you just nick the tendons, oftentimes through a little tiny poke hole, you're able to begin walking right away, uh, and you don't have to do any bony work. Uh, and so it's one of those things where oftentimes you can wait. These are not emergent type procedures. You don't need to have them done. Sometimes you can even wait years, uh, but that is something that I think would be worthwhile talking with your orthopedist about uh, in order to, to go through on a, a case on a case by case basis, because if you do already have some septum arthritis, it may be something we want to get you sooner rather than later within the span of a few months, as opposed to waiting six months or a year, for example. Uh, can bunions return after surgery? Uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, the number one complication of any type of bunion surgery is recurrence of the bunion, uh, and so. Oftentimes, getting that proper correction, correction getting the, the metatarsal aligned over the sesamoids, essentially getting the capsulolysis that you need to do uh, are key to this, essentially. But, uh, but all, all of the surgeons, no matter how good we are, no matter how many bunion surgeries we treat a year, there always uh, are some that will come back. 
<clears throat> I usually what I tell my patients if they do come back because we've narrowed the foot or we've narrowed the foot and, and decreased that bump over the, the medial aspect of the foot, even if that toe creeps over just a little bit, oftentimes that bunion is not nearly as symptomatic and not nearly as painful. So even though that bunion has returned a little bit, uh, oftentimes patients are, are still very happy with the results. Uh, and sometimes uh, if it does come back and it's symptomatic, we're able to do just a, a smaller type procedure, just a smaller aching osteotomy, for example, uh, in order to correct that. But uh, unfortunately, uh, as surgeons, we're not all perfect and there are uh, a, certain uh, a certain small percentage of these bunion, uh, bunion uh, operations that uh, will have the bunion recur. Uh, our goal is obviously to get it perfect. Uh, but, and most of the time we, we do very well. Uh, but like I said, even if they do recur, <clears throat> uh, it's one of those things where that oftentimes that bunion is uh, either asymptomatic or not nearly asymptomatic and, and patients are still very happy with the result. Uh, and so let me just double check, make sure we've got all our questions answers essentially. Uh, looks like we do. Um, so I really hope you found this, uh, this MIS <clears throat> surgery, uh, uh, surgery talk educational. Uh, I know like for me and from my standpoint, you know, it was a lot of fun to put together. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, I, I really wish we could add a little bit more interaction tonight. Um, but obviously with, with COVID and the COVID restrictions, I, I think this is our next uh, back step. Uh, hopefully, I've, I've, I've been able to provide you at least with some information. If you do have any more questions, uh, we're always <clears throat> more than happy to, uh, happy to help you here uh, at MD West One. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to be a part of such a, a fabulous foot and ankle uh, a group. We have five fellowship trained foot and ankle orthopedic specialists uh, with probably one of the largest and, and most experienced groups within uh, that definitely within the Midwest, but I even venture to say within the country. Um, and, and being here for the past uh, five and a half, six years it has been a, a pleasure, and I hope you learned a lot tonight. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time, and we'll get you off to the basketball games. <laughs>